Hey, it's Kevin. You may have noticed that data center is a hot new topic in the world of Cisco these days. A lot of people are starting to go for their CCNA data center certification. And there are no prerequisites. You don't have to have your CCENT. You don't have to have your CCNA. You've just got to pass these two CCNA data center exams. And in this short video, I want to give you the sense for what that first exam is like. It's the 640-911 exam. If you take a look on Cisco's website at the exam blueprint, there are four broad topic areas for the exam. And I'm gonna give you just a, a sample question, the type of question that you might receive in each of those four topic areas to give you a better sense of this exam and see if it's something you might be interested in. Let's get started with our first question. The first broad topic area on the 640-911 exam is describe how a network works. And you might find questions in this category are reminiscent of a CCNA exam. Recall that there is no prerequisite for a candidate to have a CCENT or a CCNA in route switch before earning their CCNA data center. And as a result, we have some fairly general networking questions, such as this one. Here we're being asked to name two devices that operate at layer two of the OSI model. We know that layer two is the data link layer. Back in the 80s, a typical device that we saw at layer two was an ethernet bridge. It could break apart collision domains and it could learn the MAC addresses that lived off of each of its ports. And if it saw a frame coming in, and that frame had a destination MAC address that resided off of a different bridge port, the bridge would know that, and the bridge would forward that frame out of the appropriate port. The bridge, though, it made forwarding decisions in software, didn't have a particularly high port density, Things have really improved back in the 1990s. We started seeing lots of Ethernet switches, including the Cisco line of Catalyst Ethernet switches. And a switch, like a bridge, makes forwarding decisions based on destination MAC addresses, but it does it in hardware. We've got dedicated circuits called ASICs application-specific integrated circuits in these Ethernet switches that can very quickly, very efficiently look at that destination MAC address and forward a frame out of the appropriate port. To give you an idea of what a modern-day switch might look like, here we see uh, some Cisco Catalyst 3750 series switches. And to review, back in the 80s, bridges, they were devices that operated at layer 2, and they were largely replaced in the 90s with the advent of Ethernet switches. That means the answer to our question is C, bridge, and D, switch. Let's take a look at question number two. And question number two comes from our second category of questions that we're going to find on the 640-911 exam. And that second category of questions is configure, verify, and troubleshoot a switch with VLANs and inter-switch communications. And when we talk about switches on this exam, we're not just talking about traditional Cisco Catalyst switches. We may also be talking about Cisco's Nexus series of switches, which are targeted for the data center. That's what we're being asked about here. We're being asked about a default account on a Nexus switch. And to give you an idea of what a Nexus switch looks like, here we see the Nexus 2000, 5000, and 7000 series of switches. You might want to pause the video now and think about the answer to this question. What is the user account? It's a default, and it provides access to a limited subset of commands. All right, let's reveal the answer. The default user accounts that we have on our Nexus switches are admin, and admin has full privileges, as you might guess, but the other default account, the answer to this question, which is C, is operator. The operator has a limited subset of commands. Let's take a look at question number three, which comes from topic number three on the 640-911 exam, and that is implement an IP addressing scheme and IP services to meet network requirements in a medium-sized enterprise branch office network. And we're getting a bit mathematical here. We're being asked to convert a hexadecimal number into a binary number. The good news is on the exam, we're going to be given that dry erase marker and that laminated piece of paper, and we'll be able to do some calculations. Let's take a look at how the calculations would go for this question. Let's get a little mathematical now and see how to convert 0x51a from hexadecimal into binary. First of all, when you see the 0x in the front of a number, don't be concerned that that's something you're going to have to convert. That's simply telling us that this is a hexadecimal number. We have three hexadecimal digits here, a 5, a 1, and an A. 
What's up with the A? Well, remember that hexadecimal is a base 16 numbering system. It works like this. We have numbers of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But when we get to 10, we keep going. But we call the 10, I'll just write it off to the side, a 10 is an A. An 11, that's a B in hexadecimal. A 12 is a C. You're getting the pattern. A 13 is a D. A 14 is an E. And finally, the 15 is an F. Oh, and I should mention, there is a there is a zero to begin all this. So we've got 16 different numbers here, 0 through 15, or 0 through F in hexadecimal. Now, what we want to do is take 51A in hex and convert that into binary. Let's think for a moment. A hexadecimal digit has 16 different possibilities, 0 through F. How many binary bits would we need to represent 16 possibilities? We would need 4, wouldn't we? 2 raised to the 4th power is 16. This means that we could represent each hexadecimal digit as four binary digits. In other words, we want to take the five, convert it to binary, the one, convert it to binary, the A, and convert it to binary, and then we just stick all those numbers together. Let's build a binary conversion chart. When you're dealing with any base numbering system, whether it's base 8 or base 10 or base 16 or, or base 2 in our case, here's the way you can start out. You can say, in our case, 2 raised to the power of 0 is going to be in the first column, 2 raised to the power of 1 is going to be in the next column, 2 raised to the power of 2 is going to be in the next column, 2 raised to the power of 3 is going to be in the next column, and that's enough for our purposes right now. What is 2 to the power of 0? What is anything to the power of 0? It's 1. What is 2 to the power of 1? It's 2. 2 squared, 2 to the power of 2, that's a 4. And 2 cubed, 2 times 2 times 2? That's an 8. Now we can construct our binary conversion table. We've got an 8 column, a 4 column, a 2 column, and a 1 column. Now let's put our numbers up here. First of all, we've got a 5. And we start to do our conversion. Will an 8 go into a 5? No, it will not. So we'll put a 0 there. Will a 4 go into a 5? Yes, it will. What's the remainder? In other words, what's 5 minus 4? We'll put a 1 in that column. 5 minus 4 is a 1. That's our remainder. Will 2 go into 1? No, it will not. So we put a 0 there. Will 1 go into 1? Yes, it will. And that means we put a 1 in the 1 column. We've now converted a 5 in hexadecimal to binary. Let's do it for the 1. Well, this is going to be pretty simple. It's simply going to be 0, 0, 0, 1. What about the A? Well, remember, the A is equivalent to a 10. So we're really saying what binary digits equal 10. Does an 8 go into a 10? Yes, it does. We'll put a 1 in that column. What's the remainder? The remainder is 2. 10 minus 8 is 2. Does a 4 go into a 2? No, it does not. Does a 2 go into a 2? Yes, it does. We'll put a 1 in that column. What's the remainder? 2 minus 2 is 0. There is nothing left. We'll put a 0, therefore, in the 1 column. Now we've converted. 5, 1, A, each of those digits independently, we've converted those into binary. Now we just stick them next to one another in the answer. We'll say that a 5, we said that was 0, 1, 0, 1, followed by a 1 in binary, and that's going to be a 0, 0, 0, 1, followed by an A in binary, and that's going to be 1, 0, 1, 0. We've done our calculation. We compare it with our multiple choice answers. Does anything match up? Yes, it does. This is option C in our multiple choice question. So that's what you should have selected. Our final topic area on the 640-911 exam is configure, verify, and troubleshoot basic router operation and routing on Cisco devices. These Cisco devices could be Cisco Nexus switches, some of our Cisco Nexus switches, they can act as multi-layer switches. They can do routing. But in this question, we're being told, you do not plan on using NetFlow on your NXOS device. That's the Nexus operating system. That's what NXOS stands for. And the question is, what command should you consider? We want to make sure that the NetFlow service is not running. Which command should we consider? 
To help us answer this question, let's go out together to a Nexus switch and take a look. If we want to see what features are running on our Cisco Nexus switch, we can do this. We can do a show feature, and we see a variety of features. Notice the state. Some are enabled, some are disabled. This question is addressing the NetFlow feature, and currently the NetFlow feature is enabled, and we're saying that we want it to be turned off. We want to disable it. The way to do that is to go into global configuration mode, and let's do a no feature, and if we don't remember the name of the features available, we can use some context-sensitive help. We're going to say no feature NetFlow, and please keep in mind that different models of Cisco Nexus switches are going to have different sets of features available, and I can use context-sensitive help to see exactly what do I have available. Here I'm going to say no feature NetFlow. To turn it off, we'll go back out to privilege mode and do another show feature to make sure that it is now disabled. NetFlow has been disabled. And to sum up our question and answer, if we do not want the NetFlow feature operating on our switch, as we just demonstrated, we go into global configuration mode and say no feature NetFlow. So for this question, it looks like our answer is C, no feature NetFlow. I sure want to thank you for spending some time with me today going through these four questions. If you enjoyed it, if you want to go deeper, if you want to go further, check it out over at oneexamamonth.com slash products. You can pick up a full-blown practice exam for Cisco's 640-911 exam. Hope to see you there.